Hello, and we thank you so much for joining us tonight as we spend a few minutes to study together. In the last video I posted, we talked about the beginning of the book of Revelation, a book that is in the religious world largely misunderstood and unfortunately because of that largely ignored. As we study through this, I want us to think about the book of Revelation as a book that unlocks a lot of things for us as believers. God's intention in the book of Revelation was to reveal things to his disciples, to encourage them, to give them hope, to give them comfort, to help them to understand the world that they were living in. And although their world is much different than our world, I firmly believe that the message of Revelation is still a message from God and it is still a message for believers today even if that message is not exactly what it was for those in the first century. As John is in exile on the island of Patmos, what we see is him having a vision, and he shares this with seven distinct congregations. And these seven congregations each have their own struggles. They each have their own personalities, and they each have a message from God. God speaks to his churches and he instructs them what they need to do in order to be who God envisions for his people to be. Very first, we meet the church at Ephesus. The church at Ephesus had some very important instructions to them, instructions that Christians need to hear even today. You see, God shares with them some things that he says, I approve of what you're doing. I'm proud of what you're doing. But he also shares with them what they need to do in order to be his people and who he wants them to be in their hearts. You see, while they did a lot of the right things, God says, you go about doing right in the wrong ways. Have you ever met people who struggled with motivation? I'm not talking about motivation to get up and work out or motivation to excel in the workplace or, or motivation of that sort. Have you struggled personally with doing things for the right reason? Have you ever wanted to do something, but it really wasn't for the right reason, your motivation, your heart wasn't right in doing it? Maybe you did want your group to succeed, but it was really not for the group effort. It was so that you could get what you deserved. Maybe your motivation was even more self-centered. You wanted your group to do well so that you could look good to the boss. You wanted to excel, not for the team you were on, but so that you could make the highlight reel. Maybe even worse than that, you've done the right thing. You helped a stranger because you knew other people were watching you and they were going to make decisions about who you were as a person based on your reaction in that situation. Maybe it is that you wanted to impress someone and you did the right thing, but it wasn't for the right reasons. This is the struggle of the church at Ephesus. I appreciate the quote that Walter Elwell gives us as he talks about the city of Ephesus. He says that Ephesus was the most important city of the Roman province of Asia, located on the western shore of Asia Minor in modern Turkey. Ephesus was built on a natural harbor whose waves, according to the Roman writer Pliny, the elder, used to wash up on the Temple of Diana. Ephesus was described by Strabo, an early Greek geographer, as the largest commercial center west of the Taurus Mountains. It was also well known as the guardian of the temple of Artemis, or as the Romans called her, Diana. This week, as we meet one of the most prominent churches in the New Testament era, the church in Ephesus, I want us to think about who they are, what they are doing right according to God, but also where they need to improve and see how that challenges our hearts to change to be who God would have us to be as his people. First, let's begin by reading in Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. God is going to begin his message to them by saying, The angel of the church in Ephesus write the words of him who holds 
the seven stars in his right hand who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and have found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. Let's jump down to verse 6. Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. We notice this phrase that God begins with in verse 2. He says, I know. And for a lot of us, we think about the knowledge of God, and you and I, we understand that God's knowledge is infinite. There is nothing that is hidden from the sight of God. Scripture teaches us that. But as he says, I know, he's going to list several things that they need to understand he is not blind to, and it's not their faults. He says, I want you to know that I know what you're doing right. And Christian, I want to encourage you to keep doing what is right in your life because God knows what you are doing. Yes, a lot of times we talk about God knows what you're doing. We're almost trying to intimidate one another into doing right. Remember, God is watching. It's almost like we talk to children close to Christmas time. Remember, Santa is watching. But here, God takes a different view on this phrase, I know. And it's not to say, I know what you're doing wrong, although he does. He says, I want you to know that I know what you're doing right. Notice some of the things that they are doing right. First, they are a serving church. He begins with, I know your works. God is not a stranger to what this church was doing right in serving other people in his name. The second thing we see, they're a sacrificing church. He talks about, I know your works and your toil. Literally, the Greek word that John uses there means to labor to the point of exhaustion. It's the springtime, and maybe you've been out working in your yard or working in flower beds or getting your garden ready to plant. Have you worked hard enough that at the end of the day, you are exhausted from doing good work that was hard work? Well, that's what these Ephesians were doing. They were working to the point that they were serving God to the point of exhaustion. I think God appreciates when his people serve him with all of the energy that they can muster. The third thing is that they were steadfast. He says, and your patient endurance, literally your endurance under trial. God says, I realize things are not ideal for you. And if I could pause and just say for a second that God knows that things are not ideal for the church today. The things that we're dealing with in our world and, and the way that for many of us, our lives have been completely put upside down. Our jobs aren't normal right now. Our, our school routines are completely changed. So many things in our world are different right now, and they are a challenge for our leaders, whether they be spiritual leaders or secular leaders. Things are challenging right now, and God is watching, and God is noticing the things that we do right. If the church is doing things that please God, please remember that God sees his church doing well. And individually, when we do right, even in hard circumstances, our Father in heaven sees what we're doing. He says to the Ephesians, you have been patiently enduring all of these things, these hardships in church. He is watching us today. I hope that we are pleasing God in these times of change. The fourth thing that he mentions is that they have separated themselves. In a world where so many people believed and were trying to teach new things that were not right. They were very careful. Notice what he says. He says, And how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and have found them to be false. You see, even as early as the church was in its infancy, when John writes these words, things have not changed for us today. In fact, False teachers have only multiplied since then. And while a lot of the things that we deal with that are false teachings today are not necessarily the th same things that John was writing to the Ephesian church about here, please know that false teachers 
our reality in our world. They were a reality for the first century church, and they are a reality for the 21st century church. So many times at Walter Hill, we've been urged to be like the Bereans in Acts chapter 17, to search the scriptures to see that what we believe and what we are teaching and what we are listening to being taught is what is truly right. What a goal for God's people to set high, high above us, to say we want to do what God wants us to do. And we can only do that if what we're listening to from God is truly from God. You see, it's easy for any of us to say, well, a Bible teacher said this or a minister taught this. But if God is not said it first, and if what we are teaching as teachers of his word are not right, people need to beware. He says that you have tested these people who call themselves apostles, who claim to be teachers from God, endorsed by God, and yet they're not. We remember what the apostle Paul says as he uh, gives his farewell speech to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20. Begin in verse 28, Paul says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Here he's talking about false teachers. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Verse 31, therefore be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. Here the Apostle Paul, as he gets ready to lead these elders who he has grown to love and respect and, and they have grown to love and respect him, they leave each other with tears in their eyes. They want to be together because they have a mutual love and respect for one another. But Paul's words to the Ephesian elders is be careful who you listen to. Be careful who you allow to, flee, to feed the flock of God. Be careful not to eat whatever is put on the spiritual table. And again, this becomes relevant as John gives a message to the Ephesian church, but they've proved themselves to be doing well in this regard. Paul was very careful to say, be careful, be alert as to what's being taught because not everything will be true. And later when God commends the church at Ephesus, he says, you've done well because you're careful who you listen to. You make sure that you're listening to a message from God endorsed by God. And the last thing he says here is that in verse 3, he says, I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my namesake and have not grown weary. Things were not perfect for the Ephesian church, but they were not growing weary. There are times when all of us are ready to throw in the towel. Have you ever been so tired or been so frustrated or maybe just been so fed up? with a situation that all you wanted to do was quit and get out while you could. It's easy when the church suffers to say, I'm just gonna take a step away from this. And we know that when the book of Revelation was written to Christians, things were not at their worst, but things were beginning to become difficult for them. And then we come to verse six, and, and this is kind of a, another side note of what God approves and commends them for. He says in verse six, yet, this you have, you hate the work of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He says, yet you have this in your favor. You will not stand for false teaching. And again, he comes around to this and he talks about how you will not stand for the works of the Nicolaitans. Notice that they are commended for hating wrongdoings and wrong teachings, but not hating people. It's often easy for us to become somewhat hostile towards people who would make us believe a lie, people who would try to teach us things that are wrong. It is easy for us to become quickly, quickly razor, to be harsh, maybe to be rude. 
And I never want our love for the truth to make us mean-spirited towards those who teach falsely. It is important for us to think about the example that the Ephesian church sets here in that they hated bad works, but they did not hate the Nicolaitans. And so we ask ourselves the question, who were the Nicolaitans? These were people obviously who were not doing right, but who were they? And really the short answer is we don't really know. There are a lot of people who have theorized about who these people are and, and what all they were teaching. In fact, the Nicolaitans are mentioned twice in the seven messages to the churches in Asia. We read about the Nicolaitans twice in the book of Revelation. But besides this, in Scripture, we don't have any context for who these people are or what they were teaching and proclaiming. So it's a little difficult to figure all of this out. What we do know from the other message to the churches is that they were promoting Gnosticism. They were infatuated with having knowledge rather than faith. They were maybe even pushing for aestheticism. That is, they were asking people to deprive certain natural things, certain physical things, for some type of spiritual benefit. And while that can be useful to an extent, we know that that's not necessarily something that Scripture asks us to do. In all likelihood, these were people who were trying to bridge some gaps. They wanted people to be comfortable in Christianity, and so they were taking parts of Christianity that people loved and wanted to embrace and, and take parts of paganism, which was so deeply ingrained in the roots of Ephesus. And they were trying to merge these things together. They wanted people to be comfortable with Christianity and not really forsake any of the things that they loved about paganism. And so they would allow people to continue to practice certain religious rites from paganism. They would allow people to do certain things that God did not ordain his church to do, but that the world around them appreciated and loved and wanted to do. So then we move from God's approval of the Ephesians to God's accusations against them. Beginning in Revelation 2, verse 4 and 5, the Spirit says, but this I have against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works that you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. The main accusation that Jesus has against this church is that they have abandoned their first love. And many times when we think about this church, this is one of the things that comes to our mind because of this passage. They had fallen out of love with Jesus. You see, the church must be motivated by the right things. Individual Christians must be motivated by the right things in our hearts in order for what we do to be perfectly right in the sight of God. You see, God is not fully pleased by obedience when there is nothing in the heart to go along with it. Do you remember what God says to the Israelites? I would rather have obedience and not sacrifice. And it's not that he did not appreciate sacrifice. He calls them to sacrifice in the Old Testament. But he says, I want you to do this with your heart. And when it comes to a place where our sacrifice to God, our service to him, if you will, replaces an obedience from the heart, God says, that's not something I'm interested in. Remember that God is a jealous God. And God wants all of our heart to belong to him. God doesn't have a place in our hearts, though, when we fill it with pride and with selfishness and with motives that are not true to the heart of a servant of God. God would have his people to do right because we love him. We think about the Pharisees in the Gospels and what was Jesus' main gripe with them. It wasn't that they didn't follow the law. No, they followed God's law from the Old Testament to a T. They were very legalistic. However, what was in their heart? Jesus many times rebukes them and he says, while you're doing the right things, your heart is so far removed from the heart of the law, from the heart of God, that you're not doing what God would have you to do. 
In verse 5, there is a great, great charge and challenge brought to the church at Ephesus. It simply calls them to repent. It says, remember where you have fallen from. That is, remember the love that you once had for Jesus. Remember the love that you once had for the Lord. That's where you want to be again. And you need to rise up to that. You need to repent. Come back to where you were. Have your heart straightened out before God. And he says, unfortunately, if you don't do this, there are consequences. God calls his church to repentance. You remember the first message that Jesus ever preached. It was the message of repentance. What was it that John was preaching before Jesus came onto the scene early in the Gospels? It was a message of repentance. What was the message that Jonah was to bring to the nation of Assyria in Nineveh? It was a message of repentance. God over and over and over again calls his people to repent. When you're not where you should be, you need to go back to where you should be. You need to repent, you need to change your heart, change your mind, and thus change your life. As we conclude and we come to verse 7, it ends with bringing all of this to a close by saying that there is action demanded. Have you ever gotten something in the mail that says action required on the envelope? I always hate that because normally it's a bill or it's, it's something I have to fill out that I'm not going to like. But God here ends this with a call for them to pay attention and to be moved to action. And I hope that as we read this and we think about what God says to his church, I hope that it resonates with our hearts if we too need to repent. Let's read verse 7. He says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life which is in the paradise of of God. He says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Do you have the capability to listen? God simply asks, do you have the ability to listen? And if you have an ear, hear. But then he changes course and he says, to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And here he brings up conquering a lot. It's something that's mentioned in every single message to the churches in Revelation. But more than that, it's a major theme of this book. 17 times we read the word conquer or conquering or conquerors in the book of Revelation in 15 different verses. One of the major things God wants to communicate as he speaks to the churches is there is a chance for you to overcome the world and the hardship that you're facing. Please listen to this, because while it very much applies to them, it very much applies to us too. He says you can conquer the situations that you're in. There is hope that you will be able to come through on the other side just the way that God wants you to as his people. Today, God says to us, you can conquer. You can prevail. How many times have we sung that faith is the victory? It is through our faith, it is through our purity, our love and obedience to God that we are allowed to conquer and be conquerors. More than that, I want us to think about what this looks like in the book of Revelation. You see, many of the Christians during this time, they would have felt conquered by their circumstances. The government is beginning to tighten its leash on the Christians. There are things all around the world in their secular world that are beginning to be more restraining and difficult for them. And God says, you can conquer this. You see, as we think about what it looks like to conquer, it's to completely defeat something. It's to overwhelmingly overcome something. And God says, while you may feel conquered at the moment, if you hang with me, if you will be faithful, you can be a conqueror. In Revelation chapter 5, God spends some time talking to his church about how Jesus has conquered. And we think about this, and it is in beautiful, beautiful terms. Read with me in Revelation 5, beginning in verse 1. It says, Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals, 
And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. Verse 5, And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and seven golden bowls of incense which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. As we think about what this chapter describes conquering as. We think simply about Jesus. It says that he stood as a lamb who had been slain but was now alive. You think about the crucified Jesus and the image that that sent to everyone on the earth who saw that, to the soldiers, to the government, to the Jews who wanted Jesus slain. They looked at a dead, crucified Jesus and they said, we have prevailed. We have conquered this movement. We have conquered his teachings and we have won. But three days later, Jesus stood victorious. The grave was empty and our Savior was alive again. Although he had been slain, although he had given his life, he had conquered. And as we think about the great beauty in all of that, John writes about this to the church. And he says, even Jesus at one time, it looked like he was slain, but he has conquered and he has brought hope to all of heaven because he is worthy to open the scrolls. As we think about conquering, please, please realize that these people needed to hear a message of hope. Please hear that they needed relief from the circumstances they were facing. And God wanted to give them a glimpse of hope of what it would look like if they repented and they continued to do what he would have them to do, but with all the right motivation and with all the right heart. God says to his people, I will allow you to conquer. You will be a conqueror in this world if you will simply trust me and follow me. You too can conquer just as your Savior Jesus has. One of the great challenges that we face today is to be faithful, but to be faithful for all the right reasons. So many times on social media, it is easy for us to say, this is what good I did today. But why do we post those things? When we talk about our spiritual successes to others, what are we hoping for? Is it to encourage someone else to do good that God would be glorified? Or do we have some other motive in our heart? Do we want people to see what good we have done so that people would say, you're a great Christian. You're a good person. I want to be more like you. Or do we want people to see our God, to see him in his glory, and to see what a revived new life in him looks like and want to participate in that for themselves? The challenge for the Ephesians was to do right continually, but to do it with a right heart. And as Christians today, may we also serve God with the fullness of our hearts, wanting to please him, wanting to serve him for his glory and for his honor. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope this has been helpful. Be on the lookout as we continue this series on God Speaks and what that means for the churches. I hope that God blesses you in the week to come.